Are you going to save a place? Wow. Yeah. You're also you flying out. You'll be the following week. Wow. So are we. <laughs> really? What's going on here? Everybody's going away. Okay, I'll take a... I'll, <laughs> I'll be here. I'll, okay, I have some friends left. Parashat <laughs> <laughs> uh, must. we must begin our discussion with uh, revisiting a statement. Revisiting a statement on page... On page 1096, which is in Parashat Vayelech. Parashat Vayelech, uh, Moshe is addressing the nation before his passing, and uh, he warns them that there are going to be challenges due to their personality and due to the, uh, the Jewish uh, approach to dealing with life and challenge. So, due to Jewish nature, expect Jewish problems, and therefore, I tell you that the only tool we have to deal with it is to record a specific text. So he tells them, Ata, we're good? Page 1096, you with me? Verse 19, and he tells them, Ve'ata, and now, and now, okay? Let, let me tell you what you need to do. Uh, to deal with the future issues. Kitvu lachem, kitvu, go ahead and write for yourself. Et hashira hazot, go ahead and record for yourself this song. And what do you do with this song? Velamda, and teach it. Et bnei Yisrael, and teach it to the children of Israel. And then... Sima, put it, place it, befihem, in their mouth. Leman, for the purpose, tiyeli, that it shall be for me, hashira hazot, this song, le'ed, it should be a witness, bivnei Israel to or against the children of Israel. Record the shira. So we wonder, wait a second. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu wants us, for the sake of our survival, to record the Shira. What is the Shira? So the first thing you do is you turn to Rashi, and Rashi tells us that the Shira is Ha'azinu and Ha'shamayim. The ne next week's portion, the one we're going to be reading this coming this week, Ha'azinu Ha'shamayim, where it is written as a song. When, when we'll look at page 1100, you'll see that it is structured as a song. It is a song that has the preamble, it has main themes in it, it is uh, set up as a song. That must be the song that Moshe Rabbeinu is referring to. And this is the song that when they come to the land, and in the future they have issues, this song itself will be there to take care of them. Ha'azinu. Uh, we know that we have 613 mitzvot. The last one of the mitzvot is actually to write a Sefer Torah. There is a mitzvah for every individual to write a Sefer Torah. Where do the rabbis derive this mitzvah? From these words. These words. Ve'ata. And now, kizvulachem, go ahead and record for yourself et hashira hazot. The Shira refers to all of Torah. And this is a source of the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah. A little bit of a challenging mitzvah for, I would say, all of us here to go ahead and write a whole Sefer Torah. We find different ways to achieve it by buying a letter in a Sefer Torah, or a portion, or a whole chumash. Uh, some of us have had the opportunity to fill in a little bit of ink in a Sefer Torah. There are different ways we try to fulfill the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah. In the late 13th century, there was a great rabbi, Rabbeinu Asher. Rabbeinu Asher. Rabbeinu Asher was the leader of, of the communities of German Jewry at the time. He eventually had to escape to Spain. And Rabbeinu Asher writes that nowadays the mitzvah is performed in a different way. The way we perform the mitzvah nowadays is by owning, writing and owning Jewish books. Now, this is before the era of print, but nevertheless there were manuscripts. 
And he notes that the mitzvah is performed. You're taking care of the baby of uh, Aussie, so that's fine. I came in the car and late. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I got a full report from him on how bad the traffic is on Bathurst. Work <laughs> <laughs> for 680. The, so what were we talking about? <laughs> Josh, what were we talking about? The rush. No the rush. Money. So what did the rush say? Uh, having books. You have books instead of uh, Sefer Torah. We're not talking about printed books. We're talking about manuscripts. Uh, manuscripts right? It is not easy uh, to write a manuscript, and therefore, as a result, when it comes to any, any traditional text like the Talmud, the Mishnah, and things after that, there are variations in the different editions. There are variations. And when I study Talmud, I often, when I have difficulty, I'm going to turn to a different manuscript. Not that I, have the, I, not that I own the manuscript, but there are books that I've copied from manuscripts. Uh, one, over the past decade, they have scanned uh, many of the manuscripts, and you could get them online, which is a wonderful way of studying because you could gain clarity through it. Uh, we, our, tr our traditional orthodox approach is that when it comes to the Torah, we don't accept the concept of variations. There's only one, right, one version of Torah, right? There are no variations. The truth is, the truth is mm -hmm. that there are about ten minor variations with Avav or without Avav, which is not bad for a text that's been around for 3,500 years. There is one situation where there's a letter, a word spelled, where in some editions it has an he, and some it has an aleph, it means the same thing. But that's it. That's the, the deal. We don't, we don't go further than the Mesorah's uh, tradition. And there were people, especially in Tveria, there were families that what they would do, they, I don't know how much knowledge they had in Mishnah and Talmud, but they knew Every single, uh, they knew all of Tanakh by heart. They studied it with the pronunciations, what we call the Nekudot nowadays. And there were schools that had precision with it. The Ben Asher school. It was a Ben Naftali school. Until eventually in the 10th century, the, from the family of Ben Asher, uh, they recorded, they recorded a ton. It wasn't a, a Torah that we could use in Shul, but it was in a form of, looked like a book in essence, but it was handwritten, and it was a precise addition that the Rambam himself, uh, you know, 180 years later says that when I got down to writing my Sefer Torah, I used the Ben Asher tradition that was in Egypt. It was in Egypt. We know the story of the Ben Asher uh, text. The Ben Asher Tanakh landed up in Aleppo. There was a migration from Egypt. There was a very strong presence of Jews in Egypt. 14th, 15th century, they make their way to Aleppo, and they remain in Aleppo, and they kept this, this it was a codex, it was called, a big book, in their shul, and no one was allowed to see it, and if a guest would come, a great scholar, they would allow him to see it with two guards standing there to be sure that he doesn't touch it wrong, or say something, you know, un, and it was a big to-do, this codex, because rabbis were aware that there's this addition that the Rambam uh, believed in, the Rambam held of it, right? And it was intact. So in Yerushalayim in the 1850s, you know the story that they sent in the 1850s? They sent, uh, there was a fellow named Shachna Yellen, who was a Yellen individual, and they sent him to copy from the Tanakh uh, variations, not regarding spellings, but regarding paragraphs. The Torah itself has suchos and stumas, they're paragraphs, right? There are open paragraphs and closed paragraphs. If you look at a Sefer Torah, there are times that you have a gap in the middle of a line, so it's like a new paragraph. But due to the fact that the paragraph begins in the middle of a line, that's called a parasha stuma, it's sealed. There are times that the paragraph will begin in a new line, and that's a parasha ptucha, right? In some chumashim as kids, you would find that the end of a portion would say, pay, 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 or sama, sama, sama. We always wonder what it was. That's the idea. There's ptucha, stuma. Okay, two types of parashiyot. And regarding the writing of a, if you write a scroll, a Torah scroll or a Megillah, it is important that you follow that tradition as well. That if there's a ptucha, it remains a ptucha. If there's a stuma, it remains a stuma. And regarding Megillah, Megillah Esther, 
uh, there were different views regarding it in Europe, and the Ashkenazi tradition from the 15th century has been that when you write a Megillat Esther, all the parshiot, all the paragraphs in the Megillat Esther are stuma. So there are gaps which create new paragraphs in Megillat Esther. They're all going to be smack in the middle of the line. Okay? When, they send, when they send in the 1850s this scholar uh, to, to Aleppo, don't go there now, to Aleppo in Syria, and he looks through the, and he copies, he stood there for hours upon hours, days upon days, he copied the traditions that appear in that text that, that the Rambam relied on, and it seems to be that a few of the Megillot Esther, a few of the paragraphs that the Ashkenazi tradition from the 15th century was, to have them stuma were actually patuach, okay? So he comes back with this valuable Tanakh. Again, it's, it's not a, a scanned copy. It's basically a Tanakh that has his notes on the, on the side, on the side of his... And he brought it back to Yerushalayim, and for some odd reason, he got back, there was an illness in the family, and it sat there in the attic. It sat in the attic for many, many years. It sat there in the attic, the Tanakh, and no one, you know, no one was able to work with it. The Aleppo Codex itself, Codex itself you know the rest of the story that it, it was concealed in 1947, November, as the Arabs uh, in Syria, after all, and they began their uh, attacks on the synagogue, on the Jewish population. By the time it gets to Jerusalem, uh, a decade later, and it's displayed, most of it is missing. Many, many, I don't know if most, but many, many pages of it are missing. Correct. The traditional story, which I've been fed, and everyone has been fed for the past 30, 40 years, was that there was a, a fire, that when they were concealing it, when they attacked the shul in Aleppo in 1947, there was a fire and it consumed sections of the codex, which, if you think about it, you have a book, right, and sections of it are perfectly intact, and parts of it are burned. It sounds a little bit difficult, but there were images and pictures, and you could actually see it in the sections that are still in existence are in the museum in Jerusalem, and there was a purplish color on the side of the pages which they claim comes from fire. And only a few, two, three years ago, there was a book that came out. Uh, he's a reporter, Matt Friedman, I think his name is, a reporter for the Jerusalem, a uh, reporter in Jerusalem Post, who wrote an inc a fascinating book on it. Ben Schultz uh, had it. I would get you the name of the, of the book if I would uh, remember it. It's a good reading. It's a good reading, maybe for, the, for one of our book, book clubs. Uh, we could go ahead and uh, bring it back, uh, get it. And basically he claims that the pages were not burnt. Uh, chemist detecting the purplish color, it has nothing to do with fire. Someone stole it. Someone stole pages from the Aleppo Korax. And unfortunately it was not Muslims, but rather people of the chosen nation, who realized that they can make a geshaft off it. And they are sitting somewhere, very odd story. A few of them made some appearance. It is, it's a very dirty market, uh, old, old Hebrew books, believe it or not. Very sad, but uh, it's a market, there's dishonesty there, and you have to be very, very careful. Uh, I know in Toronto itself, we know, our family knows you know, the Friedbergs, he has a nice collection. A few, there was a person who came to collect from him, and the next thing he knows, one of his old manuscripts, vanished. So these things happen. It's a very sad world. Wow. Returning to the, so the, the Tanakh by itself, the Tanakh of Yellen was sitting until the late 1980s, early 1990s. There was a home in, there's a neighborhood called Kiryat Moshe in Jerusalem. My grandparents lived there, my father's parents. Right next to my grandparents' house there was this big old house. Right? There was a big old house. That old house was owned by the Yellen family. When they sold it to a developer and they built a building there, as they are emptying the attic, they found an old book, an old Tanakh from the 1850s, and they were just going to throw it in uh, a Gniza. But someone decided, you know what, it's an older, older Tanakh. Yes, there are many of them. Just send it to the Hebrew University. And then someone picked it up and realized that this is the Yellen, the Yellen Tanakh that there was a great interest in it in the 1850s and 1860s, and here we have it. And as a result of that, by 
there was a school, there were those that decided to make changes to Megillat Esther, that the traditional Megillat Esther, which was all stumos, they came up with new Megillat Esther that were tuchot based on the Aleppo Codex, that made a major to-do in the rabbinic world, that you're making changes to something. On the other hand, they argued that we had an okay, because in Jerusalem there was an interest to do it by the great rabbis in the 1860s, so it made a lively, a lively debate and a lively discussion. Write books, books, manuscripts are something that are always cherished, are always very, they're cherished uh, among the people of Israel. Comes the Rosh, Rabbeinu Asher, and he notes that the mitzvah of writing a Sefer Torah today is achieved by owning Hebrew books, right? Someone at home asked, what about going to the website, hebrewbooks.org? It's a website that has like 50,000 books. But having books, Jewish books at a home, that's how you fulfill the mitzvah. There's a question if the Rosh is telling us that today times have changed and the mitzvah has changed, which is a very problematic statement, or is he saying that this is an, a very important reason, it's a very important mitzvah, it's for the spiritual survival of the nation of Israel, and you have to understand in every era how we survive. Today we survive by having books. You have to remember that if we would visit a Jewish home in the safe 7th, 8th, ninth century, most homes had no Jewish books. Most people in shul did not have a sitter or a master, so the whole structure was different. Those who had the opportunity to have a book, tells us Rabbeinu Asher, the Rosh, it is a big mitzvah to have one. I, I sometimes feel that his, his uh, emotional attachment to books came from his teacher. His teacher, the Rabbeinu Asher, which I call the Rosh, was the Rabbi Meir from Rutenberg. Rabbi Meir from Rutenberg, where, where the, the wolves, uh, saw there, uh, visited his grave, the Rabbi Meir of Rottenburg was present in Paris in 1242 when they burnt 24 cartloads of Sfarm. This was a decree of uh, Louis, one of the Louis there. And uh, the emotional impact that the master sensed of this spiritual loss that so many rabbinic institutions will not have books now was transferred to the disciple who said today that is, that is indeed the mitzvah. Now, a mitzvah to write his Torah is derived from a verse that the simple reading, right? Write the Torah. It's a mitzvah to write a Sefer Torah. Is the exact same verse that is really, or the simple reading is, and now go ahead and record parashat ha'azinu. There's a level of difficulty there. The simple reading of the text is, go ahead and write this song. The rabbinic explanation is, go ahead and write the all of Torah. How do you go ahead and put the two statements together? Not that you always have to. Comes the Rambam. The Rambam has a brilliant reading here. The Rambam tells us the following. If let's say, uh, I, I want to have something like a Kamiya to protect me. What kind of Kamiya? So I feel that if I write some portion of the Torah and carry it with me, I'm going to be protected. Right? The so Rambam will tell me, don't do that. It's not. If you want to record something because you need to study it, okay, there's, you know, you have to study it. If you want to go ahead and, you know, there are mitzvahs that we do find to place them at specific places, like tefillin or the mezuzah. But to go ahead and write, record, a section of the Torah and to keep it on its own is wrong. Ein ha-Torah nechtevet megilot megilot. Do not write Torah in the form of small scrolls and small scrolls. If there is a mitzvah to record one section of the Torah, what the Torah is really telling you is record that section with all the other sections attached to it. So it comes out that the Rambam is telling us as follows. Brilliant reading. That ha, the Torah tells us, Ata kitvu lachem et ha so Go ahead and record this song. Simple reading means, ha, simple reading, simple meaning is the song of Hazinu. Now, the Torah doesn't want you to just walk around with Ha'azinu, so therefore attach to it all of Torah. So that's how the rabbis derive from here that there is a mitzvah to record all of Torah. Nice. However, it, it sounds a little bit interesting, right? It says, like, um, I, I tell you, I'm, I'm going to sell you my, uh, my, my, my car's wheel, but a wheel alone really doesn't go too far. So with the wheel, I'm going to give you the whole car. I'm going to sell you the whole car. It's an odd way of presenting something, right? In other words, record Hazinu the Shira, and then once you record it, once you're writing it, you have to write the rest of it too, right? 
sounds a little bit odd. You give a job to someone and you say, go ahead, you know, I'm painting the window. But once you're painting the window, paint my whole house, right? The window takes five minutes, the whole house is three weeks. How do you deal with it? So, it's possible that there's a significant message here. If you would turn to uh, younger people, ask them, what's the essence of Torah? All right, so, if you're going to hear the answer, it's a book with do's and don'ts. Right? Do that, don't do that. Do that, don't do that. I would be quite concerned, because how much enthusiasm and excitement can you have from a book of do's and don'ts? I don't know, can you feel attachment? Can you convince your children, the next generation, grandchildren, that this is something important? I don't know. Uh, what if you view it uh, as a book that gives you the tools of meditation? It's good to meditate, but I don't know if that's what Jewish tradition is all about. Jewish tradition is that we have to view the book, we have to view a Torah, as one that's connected to a song. What does a song mean? A song means that everything comes together. You ever hear a song off tune? Right. You, you have? Okay. No, 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 I'm just, uh, I'm not asking specifics, but you know, you, there are times you never heard a song off tune. What is a song off tune? That things are not working together. Rabbi Hirsch once point, points out that if you take the word sheer, it sounds like yashar. Yashar. Something that's straight. A very, a very German, you know, a very German approach. Everything fits in, right? The song has its ups, has its downs. What's interesting also with the song is that there, there, I have never studied music, unfortunately, right? And I'm not, I don't have, a, 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 I can sing a little bit, but I have never studied music. But you know very well that if you take a tune, you take a tune, and even the most pleasant of tunes, but you repeat uh, over and over again one uh, segment, one section of it, it can get very agitating, right? Da na na na. So that sounded good, right? On its own. Da na na na. But what if I do it 12 times? Da na na na. Da na na na. Da na na na. What, what, you, you will get agitated. You want to hear the next. So the beauty is not when it's on its own. What's, what's the beauty of that? Uh, is it Mazel? What is it? You, you should know these things. It's Beethoven. 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 Okay. The Baruch, not Baruch, the kid. No, no. Okay. Oh, no they have uh, the Mokhe there in London. It's Beethoven, sorry. So. That sounded Baruch. Okay. Baruch. So, so you have an understanding that there is a beauty when, there, when it flows into something. It flows, correct? And that's what Torah is about. You know, you focus too much on one section. You know, you could corrupt Torah. A person that goes ahead and always preaches and only teaches about the Torah and the fact that there are lashes mentioned in Torah. Right? What kind of Judaism are you going to create with that? Right? That is Islam. Islam. Yeah, very good. No, it's a valid offspring of Judaism. We know that you have to know that there, there's something very complete there. Even the, the most magnificent song is going to have uh, some sections that sound that they're lacking a tune. There will be a gap there. When it comes together, when it comes all together, the song is something that has beauty to it, gives you meaning. Torah, the Torah is written in a way that you have a song, you have a shira. That is the essence of Torah. It's a song. It's something that gives you excitement. It's, some, it's something that gives you enthusiasm. You do it, you fulfill it with uh, a, a feeling of meaning in it, right? It gives you a purpose to live. That's the essence of Torah. It happens to be that there are other sections connected to it, but <coughs> approach Torah as your song. Okay, that's, that's what we're being told here. So therefore the Rambam can tell you that when the Torah states, go ahead and record Hashira, Shira means Hazinu, that is the essence of Torah, it is a song to you. It is something that gives you meaning, it gives you elevation, it gives you an a, a way to appreciate the world and the history of the world and the Jewish people. Torah has other sections as well, but remember what the core is. What, what is it that keeps it all together? That is the shiur. Now, all this was only an introduction to today's class, which is about Ha'azinu. So now we can start our full class <laughs> on page 1100. Now, yeah, yes? Question. You said you, you write yourself a book. 
you said most people don't write it. They might participate or they buy one and keep it. So the idea of owning a book, if you have Chumash, isn't that the same? The, the Rabbeinu Asher will tell you that today the mitzvah is fulfilled by owning a Chumash at home, 100%. Today the mitzvah is fulfilled that way. Now remember, once historically or once traditionally, it was a mitzvah that was done by actually writing a Torah, and it is a communal responsibility, so we try to participate in some way you know, to fulfill the traditional mitzvah. But there's a practical mitzvah, which in many ways what the Rosh is telling us is far more significant, that a home should have you know, a Jewish book. So we fulfill the mitzvah with only the Chumash. So we try to, as if, play it safe. We own the Chumash to fulfill the true meaning of the mitzvah, but we want to participate in running, writing a Torah. We try, at least, at one point, because we want to uh, tap into the historical, traditional uh, Misorah. Ha'azinu HaShemayim. So all of this song is one that, there's an introduction first, right? We want the heavens to tune in, the land to tune in. My teachings, this is in verse 2, are gonna, should be like rain, they should be like dew. When I proclaim the name of God in verse, in verse uh, 3, you should go ahead and ascribe greatness to our God. Verse 4 is the actual beginning. And God is here introduced as a tzur, a rock, something that's very stable and very, very, you know, permanent. And you should know that all his acts are justice. There is no flaw in his, uh, in his relationship and behavior and decrees. Verse 5, I want to get to a specific verse, that corruption is not his. In other words, this was a generation in the wilderness that spent 40 years there. It would be natural for them to say, God, you know, what, what was this long journey? We left Egypt, right? We thought we we're going to be in a land within a short period of time, and it turned into a 40-year journey. So this is what kind of God is this? How, you know, how, how does he give uh, weak directions were given, right? Why did the GPS not work? Whatever explanation they did have to blame the Almighty, so the Almighty in verse 5 we are told that it is not he, the corruption is not his, but rather it's the blemish of the children. It is a twisted and pervert generation. And it's a nation, verse 6, that is not wise. Naval, naval, is a lack of maturity. You know, when you look at the tree, that its fruit falls too early from the tree. So in Hebrew, it's called a novel, novlot. The word naval, right, which is uh, in our tradition, is used often uh, to describe someone that is lacking values, is similar to that idea that you're supposed to mature in life, you're supposed to be connected to a source, a source of wisdom. Uh, people that educate you, values that teach you wrong from right. If there is a, someone that leaves that source too early and they did not have an opportunity to fully gain maturity, they are a naval, they fell off early. So that's what we call a person who is a naval. We have a Naval Shmo with uh, Avigail's uh, husband in Tanakh, right? A person that, you know, left, left school too early or slept through all of class and did not learn wrong from light, right? Verse 7 is one where we're going to focus a touch on. We are told, Zechor Yamot Olam, you should remember the years of the past. Binu, have an understanding of Shnot Dor Vador. Develop an understanding of every generation and generation. And then you should go ahead and ask the elders, <coughs> study history. Shalavicha v'yagetcha, ask your father, he will relate it to you. Skenecha, turn to the elders, v'yom rulach. And what is it about God that you need to know? What is the important message here? So, so far we learned that God is a tzur. Uh, God is one that wants you to learn the full message of Torah. But what is it from history that we need to know? So verse 8 is the one that we're going to read here. When the Supreme One gave the nations, the Goim, He gave them a Nachala, He gave them inheritance. And that was done when He separated B'nai Adam, the children of man, when He separated during the generation of the dispersion, after the Tower of Bavel, he said to head and he establishes boundaries. Yatsev gvunot amim. He establishes boundaries for the nations. 
למספר בני ישראל according to the numbers of the children of Israel. Simple reading, and this is something that's a traditional approach. There are 70 nations that exist. 70 nations, it corresponds to the 70 children of Israel who entered into Egypt. So we have an identity as a nation with the number 70. Okay, so what's the great to do that there happens to be 70 nations and there happens to be 70 of us? So maybe the message is, maybe, that we are important that we correspond to the world. Or perhaps, we are supposed to have an impact on the world. We're supposed to change the world. Judaism is not a religion that believes that we make our way to Israel and ignore the world around us. We believe in having a positive impact. So our number symbolizes the nations of the world because we are supposed to have an impact. And we, Baruch Hashem, have the opportunity in just this generation uh, when there are c catastrophes that occur from Haiti to the Philippines and you go ahead and you hear that the hospital that was able to establish itself in the field was not the United States and not Canada and not any of the... Pro no one of these great superpowers, but rather Israel, indicating that Israel, its nature is such that it has an impact on the world. 70 corresponds to 70. So that's the idea that's mentioned here. Fine, perhaps. Another uh, explanation is, is that when the nations of the world become a nation by having boundaries, by having land, and that gives them their identity, the Jew must remember that he is different. The Jew must remember that our identity is not based on a land. Torah was not given to us in the land of Israel. Torah could have been given an, at the um, Harabite, you know, it would have been a nice thing to do, to have it right there in Jerusalem. Torah was given outside of Eretz Yisrael to tell us that you have an identity that is beyond land and you can survive without your land. The Jewish people could be away for 2,000 years and they could survive and that is because the next verse tells us Ki chelek Hashem amo, because Hashem's portion is his people and their nachala, their inheritance is not really a land, it is a relationship to God. We achieve it on our home field, right? but we are a good team, we could win on the road. Right? It's very important if a team needs to get to the playoffs, they have to win on the road. Home, there is a home field advantage that we achieve things much better at home. The crowd is there, you know, the, they call it in football the 12th man, if I'm not mistaken. So there is a benefit of playing at home, but you are a team, and the reason you are a team that can achieve things anywhere is because your chelet, your nachala, is actually gone. Okay, makes sense, it's a good message there. We read a portion that tells us that we have an impact on the world, that our identity is one that's based on having a connection to a tzur. Wonderful indeed, but I'm going to give you another reading. In Hebrew at times, when you say lemispar, it means a number. But it could also mean a small number, a minimal amount. Mispar katan, right? It could be a minimal. And we're going to reread the verse, verse 8. When God is telling us, Behanchel el yon goim, when God decides to separate the nations, when he separates people, he establishes boundary for the sake of the small number of the people of Israel. Lemispar b'nei Israel. The Jewish people are not going to be this very large nation. We're not going to be the Chinese. We're not going to be a nation. We're not going to be India. We're going to be Israel, and we're going to have small numbers. And the reality is that when you have small numbers and the world has an agenda to uproot you, you should be nervous. It's a reality. The world doesn't like us so much. Right? You have a world that the West, and you look at the numbers of where the West is going, right? the West's philosophy, uh, the West's determination to fight evil, right? well, what's happening now uh, in the United States, that they're uh, uh, fighting uh, ISIS, ISIS, right? And you have the President of the United States that has to get up and say, don't worry, we won't send any soldiers, right? Don't worry not, I promise, I promise. Like you're telling the enemy, like, worry not, right? Because he ran on an agenda fighting the Iraq war and fighting the fact that there were American forces doing terrible things like fighting terrorists. So therefore, now that he is the man in power, he's struggling with it, right? And they have to go ahead and declare that worry not, there won't be boots on the ground. Sometimes I think that the U.S. Army is going to put on Crocs, right, <laughs> and just, you know, go there, to, you know, with, uh, without the boots on the ground. But we, we have a lot of struggles that we deal with by reading the news. 
And we realize that, you know, I have a personal concern. There is now in the UK and here, uh, in, in the United States, that it will be considered a, a crime to fight in a foreign army. In other words, what they're trying to do is to prevent these young Muslims who are hearing in their mosques these schmuzen, these uh, Muslim lectures, that a good, a good Arab is a person that, uh, you know, that fights for this Islamic State. So there are young men, teenagers, that are inspired. It gives them a way of utilizing the negative energy that they have, and they go ahead and they're joining. I don't know the numbers. There are probably some from Canada as well. And they're joining. So governments in the West are trying to prevent it by making it illegal. You know how long it will take before it will become an issue for students that want to fight in Israel? Mm -hmm. right? Give it time. Give it time. Everything comes around and bites us. That's the, that's the concern I have. That this determination that young students who are graduating from the best of our schools who make their way, they want to go ahead and help the Jewish state, which, by the way, gives a tremendous amount of pride to all Israelis, which is very fascinating. In the army, when they meet a chayal boded, yeah. someone that was willing to leave America, America, which is the golden of Medina, to fight with us, so you know what? That means we're fighting for something that's valuable. So they serve a tremendous purpose. And I, I don't want to open my mouth, but it's a concern that I have, that the next thing we'll hear is that, you know, what's the difference? You know, they're going to fight... Uh, for Israel, or they're going to fight for ISIS. They say, okay, true, but who are we to judge, right? Are we to judge ISIS wrong and Israel right? right? That's very wrong to judge people in this generation. The world has an issue with us. There is one thing that actually has saved us over the past few decades, and perhaps over the past few thousand years, and that is something called nationalism. In other words, if the world would all, all unite, if everyone would get together, and decide to get along, their first agenda would be to go ahead and uproot us. There's no question about it. The United Nations, a body that at least symbolizes that, go ahead and start reading their history of who is criticized and who do they view as evil. It is, of course, the state of Israel. That's a reality. A United Nations concept is not good for the Jews. The concept of the United Nations, yes? who were the forces behind uh, the United Nations to be established, right? Of course, Yidin. Everything, everything starts with, all problems start with, uh, with the Jews. But the reality is, when there is nationalism, when Germany does not get along with France, or when India doesn't get along with Pakistan, or when Iraq has a fight with Iran, nationalism, the fact that nations view their identity separate from their neighbors, has been good for the Jews. We do want nations to get along, by the way, but we only want it to occur in an era when they're willing to listen to what's happening in Eretz Yisrael, to listen to the people of Israel. You know that on Sukkot, they have the korbanot, the male bulls that were offered in the temple, and they would offer 70 male bulls on Sukkot, and it was corresponding to the 70 nations, and it was there for the welfare. We were praying for the welfare of the nations of the world. The number was 70. How did they get 70? They had a seven-day period. And on day one, they would bring 13, day two, 12, and it would go down to seven on day seven. You add 13 plus 12, do the math if you want, it comes up to 70. Notes, Rabbi Hirsch, why are they declining? Not that we want them to vanish. We want them to, to decline to one. We do want nations of the world to unite. But we are believers that when they unite without values, without recognizing the role of Israel, it's a churban. When they unite, and they will unite, they will recognize, that's part of our faith, that's what Rosh Hashanah is about. Rosh Hashanah is about that all nations recognize God. How do they recognize God? By the fact that they recognize that the children of, children of Israel have a unique role. We want them to turn into one, but at the right time. If they unite when they're not ready, when they, if they unite while they still have that agenda to uproot us, it is the worst thing in the world. We don't like that. We want them. We want boundaries. We want nationalism. The small number of Israel, right, are few. The fact that we are few needs boundaries, needs the nations of the world to view themselves different. I speak a little bit different than you, right? My language is a little bit different than you. The type of foods I eat, it is good for the Jews because God put it there to keep us alive until everyone's ready for the mission or the purpose of humanity. So let's read the verse. Behanchel, verse 8, Behanchel, Elyon Goim, when the Almighty went ahead 
and he established nations and boundaries and he gave them their inheritance. But Hafrido Bnei Hadam, when he separated humanity at the Tower of Babel, the boundaries were established, Yatsev Gvulot Amim, he established these borders, Lemispar, due to the small number of the children of Israel. He established borders. How do you establish borders? By creating this Mishugas called nationalism. I am different than you. You're Argentinian. I'm Uruguayan, so I'm not going to like you. I'm going to hate you. So it, sometimes it comes out in a soccer game, which is good, but at times there are wars. This is England. This is Argentina. All those conflicts are there to save the Jews. Not that we want it forever, but we need it now. And that's what the verse is telling us. It is a song that has a lot of such messages that tells us about our relationship to God, the fact that we will survive. It is a reminder that there are challenges when we distant and do not make our life to be one that relates to Him. It is a shira because we know there's purpose. The word vayechoneneo, vayechoneneka, appears at the end of verse 6, which means that God went ahead and He made you firm. But Rabbi Hirsch notes that the word lechonen actually is to find something with a target. A target. He gave you something with a kavana. Jews know their target in life. When, a Jew, when you get a good Jewish education, you know there's a purpose in life. You know there's a purpose, and therefore you have a happiness. You have something to live for. When there's no purpose, when there's no moral compass, that's when we have uh, a challenge. People are lost. And may we merit indeed that as we pray on Rosh Hashanah, we should see peace in the world, the kosher peace. Uh, that allows us to live in peace. Thank you very much. Shana Tova Tova Chatima Tova. And we'll see you, those of you who are not on their way to Eretz Israel, we'll see you next week. Perhaps we'll talk to you in Kippur a little.